you haven't got the hint, it's a different day than, than usual, and it, it should be. We're going to take a break from our, our dedicated series just because it is Mother's Day, and it should be celebrated as Mother's Day. Who here has the best mother? It's good to see everybody's hands, most everybody's hands were raised. Now, how many of those people who raised their hands, how many of you are the best mother? <laughs> Quite a, few ki- quite a few hands not raised. Now on top of that, how many of you were the best child? <laughs> I think we can see a correlation between the hands raised there, but I won't go into that. This morning we're going to be talking about mothers. And every, every year I kind of take aside a special day of Mother's Day and, and talk about moms. And so I titled today... Flips here, it should. Mothers of Faith. Mothers of Faith. Now, originally, when I first titled this, I titled it Mamas of Faith because, well, I don't call my mom mother. Ever since I was little, I called her mommy and then mama. Even to this day, I still call my mom mama. But I was talking to Krista, and she said, Mothers of, of Faith sounds a little bit more professional than Mamas of Faith. So I did the good thing and went with my wife's. My wife's suggestion there. But first wife, or first mother we have, we're going to talk about today, is the wife of Manoah. The wife of Manoah. The second mom we're going to talk about today is Naomi. And the last mom we're going to talk about today is, is Hannah. Now hopefully you notice something about these mothers that I have listed and the fact that they come from three different books of the Bible, but those three different books of the Bible are all connected. They're all side by side. We'll go from Judges to Ruth to 1 Samuel. Now, I'd like to say that there's some fancy theological reason I did that, but these were the first three moms that came to mind this year for some reason, and they just so happened to be in three books that were all back to back to back. So obviously God had something to do with that, and hopefully we'll see a little bit of that. But the first mom we're going to talk about today is the wife of Manoah. Now, if I say that name, does anybody recognize that name? The wife of Manoah. I mean, obviously, it's Mother's Day, so she's the mother of someone. Obviously, we know her husband's name is Manoah, but do we know who her son's name is? It's interesting that we blank out on that. This wife of Manoah that we're talking about this morning is considered to be one of the 22 women of righteous faith in the Bible. She's considered to be one of the most righteous women, or the 22 righteous women of the world. Some of you may know her better as the mother of Samson. The fact that the entire book of Judges mentions all these names, mentions all these places, in fact mentions the name of Deborah, who was one of the judges of Israel, but yet the mother of Samson doesn't get her own Kind of interesting perspective, it puts the place of women back in the Old Testament kind of into better perspective. That she was simply the wife of Manoah. But she becomes elevated through her faith. And we read about her because of her faith. And so we'll jump into this here, but a little bit of background before we jump into it. I didn't give you the whole story, mainly because the story of Samson is five chapters long, and, well, I know how we want to get home for our Mother's Day lunches. But that said, Manoah and his wife were were barren, meaning they couldn't have children. This should sound familiar. There's at least seven other women within the Bible who were also barren, and yet God found favor on them and gave them a child. It is also in this time that the wife of Manoah, it will get into this here, but it says that that Manoah was from the tribe of Dan. But in the community they lived in was actually near the tribe of Judah. So it's actually speculated that the wife of Manoah was actually from Judah. And if we know about the tribe of Judah, it later down the line becomes the tribe that David was from. And then the tribe that Jesus was from. So don't let this fact be lost on you that this is a special 
woman here that God found favor with. But we're going to start here in verse, verse 2. In those days, meaning these days are after the Israelites went against God. They denounced God. Go figure, the Israelites did it again. And in those days, there was a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan who lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant, and they had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife she said, he, and said, Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. Well, that phrasing should sound familiar. But if we look at this, the fact that she was barren, she was barren. They had no children, but she was barren. This specifically points out that it wasn't Manoah who was the issue in their pregnancy. It was her womb that was the issue in this pregnancy. And oftentimes with, with husband and wives, when the issue of children come up and the inability to have children, it causes issues. And you begin to wonder, what's wrong with me? Or maybe it's not me, maybe it's you. And there become issues that come from that. In rabbinic, rabbinic tradition, it's speculated that, well, Manoah and his wife had issues over this and fought over this many times. And in fact, some rabbinic traditions say that Manoah himself was not so bright. And so that's why the angel appeared to his wife instead of him. It is said that Manoah had no learned knowledge of the scriptures, but yet Manoah's wife did, and that's why the angel chose her. Just interesting traditions to look at from the Jewish perspective of this story. Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. And this is where we get into the the biggest part of our story here. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You'll become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. So basically what, what this angel is saying to Manoah's wife is saying this child is going to be special. This child is going to be picked from before he is even born to save his people. This phrasing and this terminology should also sound pretty familiar to us. Now, it's usually good practice, good protocol when you're pregnant not to drink wine or any other alcohol. But it takes it a step further. Do not eat any forbidden food. That's any unclean food. Any food that wasn't considered kosher. Now, these are all within Jewish law, but the angel is pointing this out specifically on purpose. It goes in and says that this child will become a Nazarite. A Nazarite is basically a fancy term for saying that this child will be dedicated to God. Usually when a person became a Nazir or was a Nazarite, they would kind of take the oath on themselves. It was kind of a self-dedication thing. Much like we have our monks and nuns today, that was kind of the same, same thing we're talking about as far as a Nazarite goes. But there are two cases within the Bible of Samson being one and then Samuel being the other, where they become Nazarites not by their own choice, but by special dedication from either God or from their parents. And so Samson wasn't even allowed to have his hair cut. I'd like to think that's why I'm growing mine out a little bit, but that would be, that's another story for another time. For he will be dedicated to God, and he will begin to rescue his people from the Philistines. That should sound familiar to Jesus being separated from birth, being set apart from birth, and rescuing his people as well. Now, not only did his mother, the wife of Manoah, not only did she have to live by these standards, but then Samson, when he came into the world, also have to live by those standards. The woman ran and told her husband because she was so excited. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You must not drink any wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food, for your son will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite 
from the moment of his birth until the day of his death. Now, this automatically tells Samson's mother that, yes, he is dedicated from his birth, but that also means this will result in his death. His dedication and his separation for God will not only mean that he lives for God, but he will also die for God. So much like Mary, Samson's mother came into the picture knowing that her son was going to do great and amazing things, but was also going to die for those great and amazing things. This brings us to our first point this morning. Rick, can you flip that over there? Is it working? There we go. Mothers are examples of faith. Mothers are examples of faith. Now, this was a huge point for me. This was actually the first thing that came to mind when preparing for Mother's Day. Because I asked the question, who has the best mother here? But who was the first person that brought you to church how many of you was it your mother because for me if it wasn't for my mother I never would have showed up in church it was my mom who decided that we were going to church on this Sunday I wanted my French toast but she wanted the Holy Spirit see when we're young our faith depends a lot on who brings us to church my young faith depended a lot on my mother I believe it was Samson's mother is where he first got his faith. We can read throughout the rest of Judges up until chapter 16 about Samson and his lack of dedication to his faith, if you will. Now Samson, even though he was a Nazarite, even though he knew he was chosen, even though he grew to great strength, he still didn't quite live according to those laws that he was supposed to. He drank what he wasn't supposed to. He ate what he wasn't supposed to. He had pretty clever riddles from those times, but I don't know if Samson would be my first pick when it came to spiritual heroes. But you see, when it came back down to it, when Samson came to his last days, to his end times, when he's standing there between the pillars being made fun of and ridiculed with his eyes gouged out, I believe he looked back and saw the faith and the dedication of his mother. It was the strength and the excitement that she poured into him that I believe he looked back on and he prayed to God, Lord, give me strength one more time. So that despite anything else he did in his life, anytime he, he went against the law that he was supposed to live by, any sins that he may have committed. I believe he looked back to his mother and he prayed to God, God, give me the faith that she originally instilled in me. Lord, allow me to do this one last thing before I die for you because of her. Because of her dedication to you is the only reason I know you, Lord. And so Samson, with his last feet of strength crushed the pillars of the temple and crushed 5,000 or 3,000 Philistines 3,000 Philistines he crushed by bringing down that temple now if we look back a little bit earlier in scripture there's a story of Samson with a jawbone of a donkey and with that jawbone he killed a thousand Philistines single handedly with the jawbone of a donkey but yet Samson destroyed more Philistines in his death than in his living. All because what I believe is because of his faith. And his faith because of his mother. The second story we're going to talk about is Naomi. Now if we look at the order of the books of the Bible, we'll go Judges and then Ruth. However, it's interesting that the story is about Ruth, but there could be no story of Ruth without Naomi. Now, without going too into detail, how many of you remember the other sister-in-law's name? We have Ruth, who was married to Naomi's son. But does anybody remember the other daughter? Hmm. It's 
kind of interesting, isn't it? However, I think if the roles were reversed and Ophira would have stayed with Naomi, I don't think Ophira fits as well into the Bible as the name Ruth does. But maybe we'd have more Ophiras in the world than we do Ruths now. But that's beside the point. We'll look into this. Naomi had two sons. Her and her husband fled from Israel during the Philistine conquest because, well, they were going to be killed if they didn't. And so Naomi and her husband, they, they leave. They go into a foreign land with foreign gods, and they have their two sons with them. Their two sons end up finding, finding brides for themselves. And these brides, while well, originally growing up in an area of pagan worship, also believed in other gods other than the true God. And so there's an interesting family dynamic there. I'm sure the dinner table was filled with some interesting conversations. But as we can all kind of attest to, we go through certain things in life. We go through trials and we go through sufferings and we go through things that we don't expect. Well, Naomi here went through some things that she didn't expect and ended up losing her husband and her two sons. All within the span of a, a couple weeks. I can't imagine the pain and the heartbreak that they were going through. I mean, it mentions over and over again that they wept together on several occasions, multiple times. And so Naomi's plan was to go back to Judah, to go back to Israel. Because she had found out that the, the famine was over and, and Israel was doing pretty well with their crops and maybe she could find some leftover food for herself. And she wanted her, her daughter-in-laws, they wanted her to go back to where they came from, go back to their families. Perhaps they were still young enough that where they could find a, a proper husband to take care of them. Because remember the wife of Manoah? Well, what would her name be if she had never married Manoah? This is the role that women had back in this day. And so Naomi was pretty much out of options. She was old enough to the point where she wasn't going to have children. And even if she had children, would they grow up and want to marry these daughters that were already married once to her sons? And so this is where we pick up our, our story here in verse 6. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to their homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, We want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, Why should you go with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who would grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, if I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? I find it interesting here, if we look back a little bit, that the scripture here says daughter-in-laws probably three, four times. But when Naomi speaks... She doesn't call them daughters-in-law. She doesn't call them by their name. She calls them daughters. She accepts them as her own. She says how amazing they have been to her and to her sons. In fact, even, even in these girls' despair, even in their suffering, they don't want to go back to what was comfortable. They don't want to go back into their homeland. They don't want to go back into their own houses. They want to continue with Naomi which shows you the kind of relationship that they had. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. It's interesting here, we're looking through verses 9 through 11 here, and we see the role women had. The role of woman was to get married, have kids. That was pretty much it. But then we see how much more elevated mothers and women become once Jesus steps on the scene. In fact, we start naming off more women under Jesus' ministry than of, I think, any other place throughout history. And it's something amazing, amazing to see and something that shouldn't just be ignored here. 
Would you wait for them to grow and then have them refuse you? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. It's amazing here that Naomi, who is one of the spiritual mothers of of faith, she's almost, she's in mourning, but she laments against God. She said, God has raised his fist against me. I don't want him to do the same thing to you. So it's better if you just go back. Go back to your homeland. Go back to your homes. Go back to what was comfortable. Apparently God is done with me, and I don't want God to be done with you. This is what Naomi is basically telling these two, two girls. And again they wept together, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, said goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Have you ever met one of those people who are just so determined to do something, it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what's in their way. It doesn't matter who's telling them what. They're going to do what they're going to do. This was Ruth. Ruth didn't care what the future held. She didn't care any more about what she left behind. She knew Naomi's heart. She knew of the stories of Naomi's faith. She knew of Naomi's God, and in this moment, she confirms that what you believe, I believe. Your God is now my God. Your people are now my people. She didn't have to choose this, but yet she did. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and I will be buried there. I've told you guys about the times I've struggled in college, about how I wanted to do my own thing and didn't know what I was doing. And so because of that, there's actually a time where I broke up with Krista. Krista and I have been together. This year will be uh, 10 years of marriage and 14 years of being together. 14 years of being together, except after three years, we, I broke up with her. Because I didn't want my downfall to be her downfall. I was basically telling her the same thing Naomi told her. You still have a chance. I don't think I have a chance anymore. But yet Krista believed more in us than I believed in myself. And still, even after we broke up for those three or four months that we broke up, every weekend she still showed up to my parents' house. She had every weekend she would take all of her college stuff, all of her notebooks, all of her laptops, and she would go over and she would she would work on homework. She did that from the time she was in college, the time we got together until she graduated college. But even when we weren't together, she was still there. She still had faith in us. She still had faith that God had bigger plans for us. She knew when I didn't. She believed when I didn't. She was the Naomi to my mother's, or she was the Ruth to my mother's Naomi. And I can guarantee that my mom loves her as much as she loves her own daughter. I mean, I already know that she loves her more than she loves me, so that's not even up to debate. I'll never forget the day that we got married and my dad said, Josh, you just got moved to number three. I'm sorry. I accepted it willingly. Mothers are beacons of faith. Not only are mothers examples of faith that we can, we can lean on when it doesn't feel like our faith is enough, but mothers are beacons of faith. Mothers are those lights. Mothers are those, those angelic beings that oftentimes we don't deserve. That even in the darkest of times, our mothers are still there to hold us, 
to comfort us, to tell us that everything is going to be okay. That even in our darkest times, their faith still wins out. And in fact, I was blessed with Krista, whose light still shines even when times seem darker. And I'm thankful that our girls get to look up to that. I'm so thankful that our girls get to look to Krista as their example of faith, get to look to Krista as their beacon of faith. Because that's what mothers do for us. They shine when things seem darkest, give us hope when things seem bleakest. The final mother we're going to talk about today is, is Hannah. Hannah is also one of those mothers who was also barren, who didn't think that she would ever be able to have kids. In fact, her husband was actually married to another woman who had kids. Every year they would go to the temple and they'd perform the, the sacrificial uh, feast, and her husband would offer the, the sacrifices required for his wife and her children. But then on top of that, he would offer sacrifices double for Hannah. He would give double of what he was supposed to for Hannah. Because he loved Hannah, even though, he couldn't, even though she couldn't produce any children. It's interesting that we read about that in context all the time throughout Scripture. That husbands having more than multiple wives, but yet they love the one more who doesn't bear children for them. But that's a different story for another time. And as we get into this, this story here, Hannah actually, at the time of, of going to the feast, is actually praying. And she's praying so hard, but there's no, there's no noise coming out of her mouth. Have you ever prayed so hard that you, you don't realize it, but you're kind of mumbling the words? And your mouth is moving, but there's no words coming out. And Eli here, Eli sees Hannah at the feast, sees her, sees her off by herself praying, and she's praying so hard that she's kind of perspiring. She's praying so hard that she's sweating. She's praying so hard that her mouth is moving, but no words are coming out. She's praying so hard that Eli confuses her for being drunk, confuses this woman that she is making the temple dirty. In fact, let me, let me read what he says to her here. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I'm very discouraged and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I'm a wicked woman, for I've been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. After this prayer, she returns back to their home. And Eli tells her as they're going, may God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. May God fill your womb with a child. And sure enough, as they get back into their homeland the next morning, Hannah awakens and finds out she is pregnant. And because she is pregnant, she is so ecstatic in this that during her prayer she said, Lord, grant me this child. Give me this child and I will dedicate him back to you. I don't know about you, but I prayed for our first child. I prayed so hard for Brindley. I don't know if after that prayer I'd be able to turn her over and say, okay, now she's a nun. I don't know if I would be able to do that, but that was such selfless thinking on her part. That she knew where that child came from. That child came from God. And even if she can't see him grow up and do amazing things, she knows that he'll still do amazing things for God. And so they keep, keep the child there just until he's, he's weaned from the mother and just enough time to get him to the point where he doesn't really need her to sustain life. I mean, I'm 33 years old and I still think I need my mom to sustain life most days. So luckily, roughly about the five, time from about five years old to about eight years old, San, or Hannah takes him, takes him back to Eli. And we pick it up here in verse 24. 
When the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. They brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and wine. After sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I'm the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I'm giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And then there they worshiped the Lord there. God had granted what Hannah wanted most. And in return, she handed it back over to God. Now, if you don't know, Eli himself had a couple sons. And usually then those sons would kind of take over the role of leading the temple. However, if your Bible has headings, you can, you can look in chapter 2, about verse 13, and see that it says Eli's wicked sons. Some translations say Eli's useless sons sons. I can't think of a worse description for the Bible to call someone. I can't imagine that as as a son myself if my dad ever said useless son. I can't imagine the heartache that that would cause me. But obviously Eli's sons didn't, didn't care. And so because of this they were actually cast out of the church and Samuel was then elevated Samuel then was put in a position of power after Eli died. It was Samuel who would later go on to anoint David. It was Samuel who would go on to make David into, from shepherd to king. And then later from that line, the true shepherd, the true king, Jesus, would come from David. But none of that would be possible without the birth of Samuel. So that brings us to our final point this morning. Mothers are pillars of faith. Now we said mothers are examples of faith that we can look back on to give us a little bit of help, to give us that little bit of extra milk when we're thirsty. Mothers are our beacons. They give us light in our dark times. But pillars here, pillars are a structural Because as much as we we like being nurtured by our mother, we have to build from there. We talk in scripture mentions spiritual milk and spiritual meats, and, and we can't live life just on spiritual milk alone. We can't live on the examples of faith by our mother. We can't make it through just the beacon of faith that our mothers provide. We have to build. And I pray that each of you had a mother like mine whose, whose faith was able to be built upon. That as much as it hurt her to let me make my own decisions in life, as much as my parents thought some of my decisions in life were stupid, and they told me when they were, they let me make them. They let me choose. Because as much faith as they had, they also knew that it had to be my that I had to build upon their faith. And so the faith of our ancestors isn't enough to get us through life. We have to build upon it and make it our own, just as each one of these mothers did. It's a simple message this morning. And we all can think of a mother. It doesn't even have to be our own. Because when we can look at the story of Naomi and Ruth, that wasn't her own mother. It was almost an adopted mother. We can all look to that mother that we know that brings light in the darkest of times, brings hope when it seems like there is no hope. But then it is our job. It is our responsibility to build upon that faith. And as we build upon that faith, May others see our faith as something to be an example of. To see our faith as a beacon to look towards. To see our faith as something that others can build upon. Because the faith that is built upon a rock will survive all things. I'll have Ann come back up and we'll go into our time of invitation this morning. And I'll actually, I'll be in the back for this time because I need to, my throat's going a little bit here.
But if you need any prayer at all, if you need to meet any time this week, let me know. I've already got one lunch meeting this week, but I'll cancel if need be. Anytime you guys need anything at all, my phone's on, the office is open, I'm right down the road. We've got two cars again, so I can be anywhere at any time. But ask that question this morning. Is your a faith worth building off of? Because of the faith that you have built off of. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the warmth of the sunshine after, after what seems like a long, cold week. Lord, we thank you for the day that we get to celebrate mothers. Lord, this should be a celebration of, of every day. In fact, each of our birthdays should be a celebration of Mother's Day. Lord, we thank you for those, those mothers of faith who, despite the cultural norms, pushed through, pushed boundaries, sought you, and then did amazing things. Lord, I pray that we are able to do amazing things for you because of those who have come before us. Lord, let us remind ourselves of those people as we push forward. Lord, be with us this morning. And be with those mothers this morning. Be with those who may have lost mothers. But Lord, know that we know Ultimate Father, we thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.